This is the official podcast of the man behind R.D. Sinto, Inc., real estate maven, visionary, community man, Bob Sinto. Each episode of the Let Me Be Your Landlord show will feature lessons learned through experience. I'm John Iannuzzi, and Park City Productions is proud to present this podcast on all major streaming platforms. Before he became a leader in Connecticut corporate real estate with close to 4.5 million square feet, 50-plus buildings, and an occupancy rate of nearly 98%, which is well above national averages, the Sinto story started with a family-run plumbing business. What takes place over the course of the next six decades is what we will focus on here on this program. I think I mentioned to you that in our last episode that Radio 1400.am, which is Bridgeport's Black and Caribbean leading uh, platform for, for news, asked us to, to run the show. And it's going to run Tuesdays at 430 and the first Tuesday of the month, so starting in November, will be episode one. Okay, fantastic. And then they'll, you know, over the months, it's a good opportunity for people to get caught up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in thinking back to that first episode, it made me think about an email that we got, which we didn't get a chance to get to last week, which was from a gentleman named Anthony Ernst, who asked Bob enjoying the podcast early on in the series you mentioned Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And then I made a note to sort of explain this gentleman's question, which is Covey defines effectiveness as the balance of obtaining desirable results with caring for that which produces those results. So our, our listener asked, Bob, Covey refers to the fable of the golden goose, the goose that laid the golden egg. At R.D. Sinto, what do you consider the goose? Well, the goose is the is the tenant. No question. You take care of the tenant, and the tenant will always be there to lay eggs, golden eggs for you. The the <clears throat> goose in this situation is the tenant. Right. And then I looked more at Covey's bullet points, and one of them that caught my eye is th there was a, a line about synergy, okay? Yep. And that is um, one of the seven habits uh, – to synergize, yep. and I use that a lot at WPKN Radio in the newsroom, yep. but what does it mean to you? It's the six habit to begin with, all right? And it's when one and one equals 20, not two. Uh, in the book, what he talks about is when people come together under pressure, some, you all come together and you have synergy. The example he gives is... Uh, yeah, but you're on a vacation. You've been on a vacation, John, right? You're on a vacation. Everyone's tired. They want to get home. Okay? Uh, you're all a little aggravated with each other. You get to the airport, and the flight's been canceled. Okay? So now everyone has to come together. Uh, honey, you go get a cab. You go find a hotel room. You go get our luggage. I'll go, I'll go see about another flight. So all of a sudden, that synergy comes together, that everyone comes together, we have a problem, how are we going to solve it? That's the synergy he talks about in the, uh, in the Seven Habits. And you have that in, um, in motion here at All Sinto? the time. All the time. I mean, you realize I have people here working here 30, 40 years. You know, we build, build, we build space, our eyes blind. You know, the reason why we do so well is that we have architects, we have carpenters, we have foremans. We have the very best people. I'm glad that you said that. So let, I'm going to jump around now Go because uh, this next mailbag question comes from a gentleman that I worked with many years ago. Um, Mike Russo asked, how do you find the right suppliers slash materials, or I guess in this case vendors? Um, do you prioritize price, quality, or locally based companies, or something else. Well, a, a good question to begin with. All right, one we have buy Shelton first policy. When we have the buy Shelton, go to the yellow pages, see who, who sells it in Shelton. So support the town that you live in. Number one, you know. Number two, you know. One time I built a building, uh, Thai Communication. The sprinkler guy was like fifty cents a foot cheaper. Okay. But he was three months behind schedule. 
the rent was 87000 a month. That 50 cents got lost in the first two weeks. So that my policy after that was find my my vent my uh, subs contractors who could perform. I've had the same electrician for forty years. He gives me fair prices. Same sprinkler guy for forty years, because the, the pricing isn't so important to me. The delivery of the product and being on time and guaranteeing. Now the other thing I do I do design built design built. Okay. So New England Mechanical does most of my uh, HVAC work, okay? They design the system and they put it in, okay? Now, if a room is too hot or too cold, that's their problem. They have to fix it. So when you go in that direction, you can't get a lot of pricing from different people because it's their design, but you don't have any problems of whose responsibility. So what I try to do is to each vendor make him responsible for the design and the construction. Um, Forbes had a headline. Let's go to the other question, go actually, ahead. first. This is a good one, too. This is from Tess Sandler. Mm -hmm. She asked, how did you decide between becoming an entrepreneur or working for someone else? Oh, that's a great, 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 great question. Great question. I was so lucky. 1966. I was at 65, right out of high school. That summer, I worked for North American Van Movers. Okay. I was always a hard-working person. I, I was being paid $2.18 an hour. So John, right down on Arniston Avenue, John comes up to me. He's the guy running the facility. He said, Bob, will you like to learn how to drive a 16-wheeler? One of those trucks. I said, now you remember something. I'm 18 years old. So I said, John, I'd love to. So... Two weekends, Saturday and Sunday, we drove around Bridgeport on a flatbed. You understand what I mean by a flatbed? I sure do, yeah. Okay, so that you can see the movement of the truck. You understand? You, it would be, so we drive around for two weeks. So one day on the next Monday, he says, Bob, I think you're ready for the road. Ready for the road? Okay, now I have three, guys, th three Spanish kids from Mariner. Um, um, I forget the name of the village. It's on Arnston Avenue. Marina. Marina Village. Okay, and me, and now I'm on the road, 18 years old with these three Spanish kids. Okay? I lived there for 15 years, okay. so I know I know those roads. So anyway, so now I'm on the road. <clears throat> now I'm working 82 hours a week, and why 82 hours a week? Because if you drive if you drive to, out to uh, Danbury to load someone to move them to West Hartford, okay, you can't leave at six or seven o'clock. You have to leave when the truck is empty. Okay, I was I was sleeping. I I slept every place except I was falling asleep all the time because I'm working eight two hours a week. So now the truck overheats. I'm in I'm in uh, New London. Fisher Brothers owns this company. So I drive into the yard, and I said hi, and I as polite as I can be, you know my truck is overheating. Can Someone take a look at it. So the guy goes, who the F are you? Now, you got to remember something. All these guys are union drivers, okay? They want to know who I was. I said, I'm sent up from Bridgeport. Next thing you know, I'm in front of Mr. Fisher in his office. So he says, well, Bob, tell me what you do. I tell him what I do. You know, how do you get paid? I said, Mr. Fisher, it's company's policy. Either I get cash, a bank check, or a certified check for the cost of the move before I open up the back of the doors to unload. And what do you do with that money? I give it to John the next day. All right, the next day when I come to work, they're taking John out of the office in handcuffs. In handcuffs, okay? Because he was embezzling the money. So he had a connection to mechanics and farmers. So anytime the, sta anytime the job was done within the state, 
he didn't have to worry about me being outside the state. He would have a connection mechanics and cash a check. Okay. When they took him out of handcuffs, this is what I said to myself. I am never going to work for someone again the rest of my life. Here I am killing myself to impress my boss. And my boss is stealing. Okay? Okay? Because I was always a hard worker. So that, you know, everyone saw that. So that's when it took place at that moment. It's incredible. Great story. Well, that's a true story. They're all true stories, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, on that theme, by the way, we, we looked to Forbes. They had a headline, How to Overcome the Fear of Transitioning from Employee to Entrepreneur. Do you have any advice? No. I, I, the, the advice is that you just have to have confidence in yourself. You have to believe you can do it. You have to believe you're going to make mistakes. And the mistakes are okay because that's the cost of learning. Okay? Uh, I was lucky is that I was a plumber. So even though I was doing this real estate, I still took my plumbing truck home every night so that if, it, if an emergency call came in, I ran out and changed the circulator, cleaned out a John, and I always got paid cash at night. So I always had something to give my wife, you know, a little money here and there, you know. So I always worked as a plumber, even though when I was developing my real estate abilities. So it's always good to have an income, in my in my case, you know. It's always good to have an income while you're learning the other business. So, you know, that's... I have one friend who uh, worked in the bank. I'm not going to mention his name. But he comes and he tells me, Bob, I'm quitting the job. I want to become a real estate developer. And I said... I said you should say, I got a podcast for I your said, list. Talk, yeah. I said, uh, I don't want to say his name because I, I, I'll make up a name. I said, listen, Jimmy, you've got the greatest job in the world. You work at a bank. You go out to dinner, no one picks up. You never pick up a tab. You go to football, baseball games, no one picks up a tab. You know, you need your house painted. I took care of it. I got your house painted for you. You never got a bill. Okay? Life is great. Now, I'm telling you that I'm telling you now the truth. The truth is, this business I'm in is, is difficult. I have every nickel in motion, okay? I have to tell you how great I'm doing because I expect you to lend me money. I can't tell you the truth. The truth is that this is a tough business. You know, please don't do, please don't quit the bank. Well, he quit the bank. It didn't work out well. Okay? You know, you can't, you know, you just can't see. One of the, one of the secrets I tell people, when anything looks Simple or easy, it ain't. <laughs> it's not simple. If something looks simple, it's not simple. You know, there's things in my business that, you know, like I said a second ago, you know, your, your heart has to be on fire and your brain on ice. That's what you need in this business, okay? You have to have a pa- I tell you the truth. This past weekend, I helped the tenant move furniture around because they got screwed up and they i went myself and moved the furniture for two hours on a saturday afternoon with a tenant okay i have to tell you that probably helps but that probably helps people hearing that yeah that's true because sometimes we have to stuff down our pride oh no no it's not crunching right it's crunching you know but you can't you know you know you know you're here to serve people this girl got stuck and she needed help and i said okay i'll be there i'll come Saturday afternoon, one o'clock. Mm. Now I made a little mistake. I li- I lifted things I shouldn't oh, no. lift. <laughs> That's back to our conversation I, about I, our I health. Said, I said I said I'm not as young as I think I am. That's oh I can tell you, I had a tough Sunday getting over this. Forbes, by the way, said that the first step they think is to identify what you're afraid of, get it out of the way. Oh, I you know, I don't you know. I uh, I I couldn't comment on that. I don't. The next question came to me in person, and it's from someone that I respect, but always seems to have this issue. He's got a lot of great ideas, but he's always looking for investors. <laughs> How do you? I mean, you you've talked about this in the past, but do you have any? 
any advice for people who have a good idea how do you pitch that good idea to people like how do you how do you take something from your head and and put it into a you know a deck or a slideshow to show people that this that this idea could work i you know i don't know how to you know that's how did you do it well, I, I, I did it because I, I grew into the business. I grew into it, you know. You know, I made mistakes. And I remember one time I bought a, a three-family for like $78,000, and I sold it for $72,000 or 74000 or seventy six. It was 1000 more than I bought it. And the lawyers at the time said to me, Bob, I don't think you did so well on this. I said, you're right. I made a mistake. I'm lucky to get out. So, you know... You know, you, I, I think I've said this before. I'll say it again. Intelligence is a liability. Explain that. Oh, well, if you're very smart, you're going to see too many alternatives. I, had, I swear to God, I had a guy call me up. Did we talk about this before? We had a guy call me up. I was on the cover of uh, uh, Connecticut Magazine, 1987. I was on the cover. How to Succeed in Business by Rui Trying was the name of the top cover, okay? And I was there because I was 16, I was 87, I was 40 years old. I get a phone call from a guy and says to me, uh, uh, Bob, I'd like to come work for you. I'm 40 years old. I'm in the basement of a Cambridge Apartments on Main Street, okay? 2727 Main Street, a, a building I bought, all efficiencies. That was an experience of collecting those rents every Friday. Every Friday, not no monthly rent, but still tough. And uh, so I said, "Okay." I said, "I'm not hiring anybody." He goes, "Well, you know, could I at least talk to you? And uh, can I send you my resume and talk to you?" I said, well, "You want to send me your resume? You can send me your resume." Swear to God, this is a resume. Six years at Yale Architectural School. Two years at Harvard Business. Then he goes back to Yale and he gets a degree in law from Yale Law. Three more years. Okay, can you imagine me looking at this resume? A kid who couldn't read. So he calls up and I said to him, I said, listen. He goes, Bob, did you get my resume? I go, yeah. I said, do you make this up or is this all true? He goes, no, no, this, oh, that's true. You want me to have the school send you the transcripts? I said, no, that's okay. So I said, you want to come in and talk? I'll be happy to talk to you. But I, I want you to know before you come in, I'm not hiring anybody, but you want to come and talk. So he comes in and talks. And he says, uh, Bob, um, and so I said, why do you want to come to work for me? He goes, well, I think you, you're doing very well in this real estate development business and you're making a lot of money. And I thought it's something I'd, I would do. So I said, okay. They don't teach real estate development at Harvard Business? He goes, no, they don't teach that. I said, okay. When you walk down the steps above the door, was the sign that said university on it by any chance that I don't know about? I said, listen to me. Listen to what you're asking me to do. You're asking me to teach you my business so that you can go in competition with me and make money. Okay, why would anyone do this? All right, so there's an example of a guy with tremendous education, a tremendous intelligence, and he's got no human capital. Okay, he's asking someone to teach him a business to be in competition with him. How do you do something like that? So that's an example. All right. You've successfully avoided politics on this program. Yes. But that doesn't mean we can't discuss the fact that the elections are around the corner. The Shelton Planning and Zoning Commission is going to be on the ballot. And your name <laughs> comes up in the discussions. And specifically, there was a questionnaire for all the candidates about balancing responsible development and economic growth. And your name was in there a bunch. What are your thoughts... I guess specifically on Shelton and the towns that you operate in, on balancing responsible development and economic growth. Okay. Listen, you know, 
To begin with, I pay five times more taxes than the next closest person on the city list, which is a utility company. Okay? So the amount of jobs in that I've created in this town is spectacular. When I came to this town, there was nothing on Bridgeport Avenue. That, that road, that Commerce Drive that you drove up was a logging path. I built that road. I built it twice. All those traffic lights at exit 12 I paid for, okay? So we've created jobs here for the community that benefits everybody. Now, in all the zoning that we've done, we've never downzoned once. In other words, I've always zoned in properties that were industrially zoned. So I never went into a residential zone and asked to downzone it to commercial, okay? The zoning commission in this town has been spectacular. They, you know, because they really wanted the town to grow. Uh, Nippy Russell is, is, is um, when I got these ten-story buildings approved about 1984, 80, 83. Nippy uh, said, "If you're if you're stupid enough to build ten-story buildings with parking garages up here, we're stupid enough to approve it." <laughs> you know, okay. And in the town, the zoning has been, and also the, you have to understand something about Shelton and, and Topo land. It's called the valley. Why is it called the valley? Because all the water flows to the Housatonic. All the land flows down to the Housatonic. So you look any place in Shelton, it is nothing's flat. Everything's on hills. Go and look downtown Shelton. Just walk around. All you see is hills. Okay, what does that mean? That means you have to have a flexible zoning regulation so that each piece of property, you can give a PUD zone to it, specific to that property, so you can develop it. It was like it's impossible to have a regulation to cover all the different slopes in the town, okay? It's, and the town has been, you know, the zoning has been very good. It's been a great community. Very nice people. Very good people. What does it feel like for you to drive through town? Do you ever take yourself out of it and, and, and just look at everything well, I, that, I, I, that you've I, built sometimes, here? Sometimes you, know, you drive up and I can't believe that, you know, I don't believe. Yeah. There are times when you just, you know, when I came here, it was nothing. I was just going to say, I've heard people lament about what it looked like, you know, you way know, back when. One time. You know, I'll give you an example of zoning. I was at, uh, I was in trying to get a building approved, and a, 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 uh, the hotel down here next to Starbucks. We wanted to get that approved, and uh, and I explained that the, the, and, and this lady uh, gets up, and I don't want to mention her name, but she says, when I came to Shelton. She said, you know, I came here because I wanted my horses to have a nice home. She says, now all we have here is traffic. And she goes, I love my horses. And then she says, and Mr. Sinto, don't you have enough? So she sat down. So afterwards, I get up to and say, Mrs. X, whatever her name was. I said, you asked me if I had enough. I said, I've really had enough for the last 10 years. I've had enough. Okay. But just like you love your five horses, I love the 40 people who work for me. They depend on these jobs to pay the health care, to pay tuition, to pay their rent, to go on vacations, pay their mortgages. Okay. I love my people. What should I tell them now, Mrs. X, that I have enough? They could go find other jobs. Is that what you want me to do? Okay, I'm here not for me. I'm here because I have people who really depend on me working. And this is a great project and should be approved. And, and it was approved, okay? So, and, and now we have another hotel. But, you know, those are the kinds of thoughts, some of the kinds of zoning that you get involved in, you know. People are a little selfish on zoning, you know. They, they see something and, you know, they don't realize, yeah, that used to be green, okay? It's not green anymore, okay? But now there's people who have jobs. Trade-offs, okay? 
And it's, all, it's always trade-offs. They should be care about the next generation. They should care about people, other people. Who, these people who are retired, they have their income, they don't care about anything else, they don't care about the next generation. That's not right. Do you think about the future of a property when you build, do you think, do you look around and say, what, you know, how, what will this be in, in a couple of decades? Do you well, build with that always, in mind? Oh, yeah. Everything I do, I try to make sure that we do something that has longevity to it. We, we use the best products, best glass, best heating systems. Yeah, because, I, you know, I feel I built for the next generation. It's been a great episode. All right. Thank you. Um, I want to remind people again that Radio 1400... Dot am is going to start from episode one, okay, and each month we'll put up a new episode Good. that we've done. So well into 2024, people can catch up Great. on what we've discussed here. Thank you, John. This has been fun. Thank you. Good deal.